All right, here we go. Revelation chapter 3. We're going to be looking at the church in Sardis. And I've called this what is, it's typically referred to in this way. I'm just using what others have said, dead orthodoxy. And so beginning at verse 1, chapter 3, reading to verse 6, we read, And to the angel of the church in Sardis write, These things says he who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know your works, that you have a name, that you are alive, but you are dead. Be watchful and strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die, for I have not found your works perfect before God. Remember, therefore, how you have received and heard. Hold fast and repent. Therefore, if you will not watch, I will come upon you as a thief, and you will not know what hour I will come upon you. You have a few names, even in Sardis, who have not defiled their garments, and they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. He who overcomes shall be clothed in white garments, and I will not blot out his name from the book of life, but I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Now, I'm not sure if we had this done or not. I had mentioned something about a slide. John, do you know if it's, it, we have a slide? Okay, I'm going to show you a slide because I want to point something out. Um, if we can, okay, turn the lights off so they can see it. There you go. Thank you. Okay, I want you to look at this for a moment. And, and uh, I've got a light here. I'm going to read, and we'll leave the lights off so you can look at this because this is my introduction. I want you to see something. Uh, in uh, in this picture, and I want you to look at it very closely because there's something I want to share with you. Uh, everybody here has heard of a man named Vincent. We call him Vincent Van Gogh, though they pronounce it differently. Gogh, I think. Uh, Vincent Van Gogh uh, uh, lived from 1853 to 1890. He composed a famous painting called The Church in Auvers. That's that painting right there. I want you to look at it because the church is situated at a fork in a road and notice that there's no direct path into the church building. Look behind it and you see the night sky. And the night sky takes up a large part of the painting. And notice it is without stars because that's intended to communicate to us emptiness. If you look closely at the church roof, it's unstable. It's even trembling. There's no door allowing entrance. There's no light in the church building. And the building appears empty. As you look, you see a woman passing by, and she's, uh, this is a church in France. That woman is a, a, a Dutch woman. She's dressed as a Dutch woman. So you see this woman passing by. She's heading into the darkness, and she's totally alone as she's in a fork in the road going around the church. So the church building he painted is simply a building. It's a building with no life within Art critics and experts have said that this was how he viewed the church of his day. His father was a Dutch Reformed pastor, and his grandfather was a theologian. At an early age, Vincent desired to be a pastor, but was not accepted into seminary. He tried to become a missionary, and he went to a coal mining village in Belgium at the age of 26. Someone said, taking Christianity to its logical conclusion... Van Gogh lived like those he preached to, sleeping on straw in a small hut at the back of the baker's house where he was staying. The baker's wife reported hearing Van Gogh sobbing at night in the hut. His choice of squalid living conditions did not endear him to the church authorities, which dismissed him for undermining the dignity of the priesthood. And this experience may have helped him develop his view of the church. It had a name that it was alive, but it was dead. From a distance, the church building appears welcoming, but it was without life. And the condition of the church of his day mirrors the concerns for Jesus, of Jesus for Sardis. It has an appearance of life, but in fact, it is spiritually dead. You can turn the lights on. In Sardis, the spiritual darkness of false teaching and bad living extinguished the light. The reputation was that they're alive. But in fact, Sardis, Jesus said, is dead. In Sardis, the spiritual darkness of false teaching has affected them. 
And so what has happened is the true condition is a church without life. Now, I introduced the study of the seven letters by, by saying that each letter has a threefold application. Let me remind you of this as we're going to go through this in a moment. I, I shared with you that you have what is called the primary, meaning that the letter that was written has a direct bearing on the congregation itself, the church in Sardis. But it also has what is called a personal because there are people within that church there, that church body, that need to hear what the Spirit has to say to the church. And then third, and this is what we'll be looking at today in uh, more, uh, a, a lot more information will be coming because of this. It, we have the prophetic. It represents seven stages of church life from Pentecost to the rapture. The rapture. So these letters from Jesus reveals a slow deterioration throughout church history. They reveal that the church over time is slowly losing her witness to the world. Each letter, again, contains a message to specific churches in the first century. And these churches were being spoken to by Jesus for current conditions and problems. But prophetically, the message is applied to churches throughout history. And they're applicable to us today as we read the letters and are instructed by them. Now, as we went and looked at Ephesus, Ephesus prophetically represents the church in her infancy from Pentecost to AD 160. This is the church that was on fire but has lost its first love or left their first love. We saw Smyrna representing the suffering church, uh, a church that because of the witness for Christ began to suffer persecution. We saw Pergamos representing the compromising church from AD 313 to AD 600. Uh, this was a church that was guilty of being worldly and sexually immoral. It was infiltrated by, by bad teaching. And then you look at Thyatira. Thyatira prophetically is what is called the apostate church from A.D. 600 to 1500. And we saw this, how they tolerated Jezebel, who introduced heresy and idolatry and moral impurity. And today we're going to be looking at the next phase of the church prophetically. We look at the church in Sardis. Now, geographically, Sardis was a city situated in a fertile valley 30 miles southeast of the city of Thyatira in modern Turkey. It was important, and it was a wealthy city. It was located on a commercial trade route. Much of its wealth uh, resulted from textile manufacturing, its dye industry, as well as jewelry trade. Most of the city practiced pagan worship with mystery cults and secret societies. There was a temple established for Artemis, also known as Diana, and, and she was the virgin goddess of hunting and childbirth, traditionally associated with the moon. And they also worshipped the goddess Sibylle, who was known as the Great Mother and was the mistress of wild nature. She was thought to be a healer and was the goddess of procreation. She was worshipped through orgies and sexual depravity. The origin of the church is unknown, but there are those who believe Paul or perhaps John may have planted this church. When you look at Sardis, the word Sardis literally means the escaping ones or those who come out. And prophetically, Sardis represents the Reformation. Again, each letter had a primary element with a direct bearing on each church. Each had a personal application with members needing to hear what the Spirit says to the church. And each letter has a prophetic element representing eras in church history. Prophetically, Sardis represents what has been called dead orthodoxy. That especially refers to the years 1500 to 1750 A.D., which is also coinciding with what has been referred to as the Protestant Reformation. Now, I have to review a few things with you. By 1500, Idolatry, impurity, and bad doctrine has already leavened the church. Last time we were together, I was sharing with you how certain things had crept into the church, praying for the dead, the office of pope, worshiping saints and angels, the establishment of the mass, the worship of Mary, the canonization of dead saints, the doctrine of transubstantiation, the practice of only priests reading and teaching the Bible, purgatory, Catholic tradition, given equal authority with the Bible, that had all found its way into the church through the Roman church. So history records various believers who broke away from the Roman church and the suffering they endured. The leaders of this Reformation were men like Wycliffe and Zwingli, Knox and Calvin and Luther. The break really begins around October 31st, 1517, when Martin Luther nailed his 95 theses to the door of the Catholic church in Wittenberg, Germany. 
It's been said his voice resounded in the ears of so many who were tired of the Roman system. When Martin Luther was called to give a defense of his beliefs, this is what he said. Since your majesty and your lordships desire a simple reply, I will answer without horns and without teeth. Unless I am convinced by scripture and plain reason, I do not accept the authority of popes and the councils, for they have contradicted each other. My conscience is captive to the word of God. I cannot and I will not recant anything, for to go against conscience is neither right nor safe. Here I stand. I cannot do otherwise. God help me. Amen. And so the reformers believed that the church drifted from the essentials of Christianity. And because of this, they summarized their theological convictions with five phrases. We've all heard some of these. Sola Scriptura. The Bible alone is our highest authority. Sola fide, we are saved through faith alone in Jesus Christ. Sola gratia, we are saved by the grace of God alone. Solus Christus, Jesus Christ alone is our Lord, Savior, and King. Soli Deo Gloria, we live for the glory of God alone. And these are the statements called the Reformation statements, the essentials, the five phrases. So the church started out well. The Reformation went well. But over time, it became institutionalized. And the life of the Spirit has been quenched. We'll see this as we go through this. It's been replaced by what is called dead orthodoxy, believing the right things without the passion of conviction. So he begins in verse 1. To the angel of the church in Sardis write, these things says he who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know your works, that you have a name, that you are alive, but you are dead. And that's how Jesus begins. The description that we see here about the, the one with the seven spirits and the one who holds the seven stars comes from chapter 1, verses 4, as well as verse 16. And I mentioned to you the seven spirits. The seven spirits represents what is called the fullness or completeness of the Holy Spirit. It's an image that you find in the Old Testament in the book of Isaiah. And it's an image used to speak of Messiah. In Isaiah 11, 1 and 2, it says, There shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse. A branch shall grow out of his roots. This is a picture of Messiah. And the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. The Spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. When you read that, you see he speaks of the spirit of the Lord, and then he gives to us six other words that relate to that. Spirit of wisdom, spirit of understanding, spirit of counsel, spirit of might, spirit of knowledge, spirit of the fear of the Lord. These are the seven spirits. This is speaking about the fullness of the spirit. And so by saying seven spirits, Jesus is declaring that he possesses what is called the fullness of the Spirit. In John chapter 3, verse 34, it says, for he is sent by God. He speaks God's words, for God's Spirit is upon him without measure or limit. So Jesus Christ is the one with the fullness of the Spirit, and Jesus is the one who is in control of the church through the Spirit of God. We need to remember that spiritual work requires spiritual workers. And we need the Spirit's help in our lives. We can't accomplish the work that God has for us without, without the Spirit. We cannot accomplish it in the energies of our own intellect and strength. It takes the Spirit of God to do spiritual work. In Jeremiah 9, 23 and 24, Jeremiah writes, This is what the Lord says. Let not the wise man boast of his wisdom, or the strong man boast of his strength, or the rich man boast of his riches. But let him who boasts, boast about this, that he understands and knows me, that I am the Lord who exercises kindness, justice, and righteousness on earth. For in these I delight, declares the Lord. We don't rest in our own strength and ingenuity, our own wealth and talent. We're to be walking in the power of the Holy Spirit. And Jesus is the one who leads the church by his Holy Spirit. And everything that the church does in the world is intended to be accomplished by the work of the Spirit. And that's something that the church needs to remember, especially in these last days. You see, I fear that the church is being led to believe more in our own effort than the Spirit of God. A.W. Tozer said it like this. He said, 
If the Holy Spirit was withdrawn from the church today, 95% of what we do would go on, and no one would know the difference. If the Holy Spirit had been withdrawn from the New Testament church, 95% of what they did would stop, and everybody would know the difference. And I think that the church today is forgetting. And what we see here in the church of Sardis is something that applies even to this day. You see, Jesus taught the church that we're to rely on the power and presence of his spirit. He said this, and, and as you go through the gospel of John, you'll notice that he says that his spirit is going to abide with us forever, that he'll teach us spiritual truth, that he'll bring to our remembrance the things that Jesus has taught us. He taught us that we'd receive power when the Holy Spirit came upon us. And it's by his spirit's power and fruit of the spirit that we're to serve him. You shall receive power. After that, the Holy Spirit has come upon you. You shall be witnesses of me in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. You need the power of the Holy Spirit. And in Zechariah chapter 4, verse 6, it says, This is the word of the Lord, is Zerubbabel, not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord. You see, in Sardis, sin and failure were a sure indication that the spirit was being quenched. So Jesus speaks concerning the fact that he is the one who has the seven spirits of God. But he also speaks of the seven stars. And we know that the seven stars are the seven angels, the pastors of the church. And Jesus is the one who anointed the pastors of each of the churches. And the ministry of the pastor is to be the direct result of Jesus anointing him by his spirit. It is his spirit that gifts. It's his spirit that equips the pastor, and the pastor is to know this. The pastor is entrusted with oversight of the church, the church that they serve. The pastor is to take their orders from God as a sovereign Lord of the church, and the pastor is accountable to Jesus Christ, and that's why Jesus is addressing him like this. The pastor is to be a shepherd. The pastor is to feed. The pastor is to care for the people. In 1 Peter 5, 2 and 3, it says, Be shepherds of God's flock that is under your care, serving as overseers, not because you must, but because you're willing, as God wants you to be, not greedy for money, but eager to serve, not lording it over those entrusted you to you, but being examples to the flock. And that's what God is calling us to do. One, is the church is to move in the power of the Holy Spirit, and two, the pastor is under the supervision and empowerment and anointing of Jesus Christ and accountable to him. And that's what Jesus is beginning by saying when he speaks of the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. And he goes on to say, I know your works, that you have a name that you're alive, but you are dead. You're quenching the Holy Spirit. I know your works thoroughly. And as I'm looking at your works, I see imperfections in them. They appear to men as good. But I see that they're being done without love for me and without the power of my Holy Spirit. I'm inspecting you. Perhaps they had a reputation in the area of being a great church, active. They were the church alive that was worth, worth the drive. And so he's speaking to them. And he's rebuking them. And he's telling them, I'm aware of you. Notice how he says, you have a name that you're alive, but you're dead. You become famous for faith, for your diligence, for your devotion. Your outside appearance of holiness has caused people to think that you're Christians. You appear to live in the spirit. But in fact, you're spiritually dead. Though you have a reputation of being on fire, your spiritual life is dried up. And the appearance of life is solely due to a reputation of a once powerful church. You are Christian, he's saying, in name only. Your church's theology is correct, but you're unsaved. This is a church quenching God's Holy Spirit, caught in dead orthodoxy. They have truth without passionate dependence on it. There's no genuine faith in Jesus Christ. The members of the church are unsaved. They're dead in trespasses and sins. They claim to believe the right things, but they're not saved. They've never embraced Christ. They spiritually are like bodies in a casket, dressed beautifully, but without life. 
What can a pastor do to remedy this situation? Well, Jesus gives instruction in verse 2. He says, be watchful and strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die. For I have not found your works perfect before God. So he says, be watchful. Jesus is returning soon. Wake up. Give your life to him. He's saying, expect my return to planet earth to be soon. And the pastor should be encouraging the church to be prepared to be with Jesus Christ. The expectation of the rapture is intended to spur us to service to Jesus Christ. There are a lot of believers today, if I were to talk to them about the rapture, uh, they, they know, they can speak about it, they can give me scripture about it, they can tell me what it is. I didn't know what the rapture was when I first got saved. I'd never heard of it in my life. You know, I was raised in a, in a church that didn't speak concerning it, so I didn't know what the rapture was. And when I first got saved, I began to hear that there's going to be a time when Jesus Christ is going to take the, 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 the church out of this condition. We'll see this later on. But he's going to take us out of the world immediately. And, and it's going to be in the twinkling of an eye. We're all going to be changed. We're going to be with the Lord. And when I began to hear that, I thought, man, that's really going to happen? That sounds like science fiction. That sounds like just a story. Well, there are a lot of people, you know, 50 years later that have heard a lot about the rapture. Lots of books have been written. Lots of movies have been made. Songs have been sung. I wish we'd all been ready from, from that song to so many others about Jesus is returning soon. There are a lot of people who can talk about it. And I've spoken to numerous people over the years who, who say, oh, yeah, the rapture is going to happen. But they don't live as if they expect it to happen. They don't live in expectation. They go on with their life day in and day out, and they have forgotten the promise of Christ. And Jesus is speaking about that. He's saying, the expectation of my return should be provoking you to serve me every day as if I'm coming that day. And what has happened is you have good theology. In other words, you know what it says, but you don't have good practice. You're not doing what it says. So you're able to talk about it, but you don't live as if you believe it. You see, we're to be, we're, we believers are to live as if we expect to see Jesus at any time and to be prepared for him. Yeah. Amen? Amen. Now, when you read your Bible, I, there's hundreds of verses. I'm, I'm going to give you just a few just to show you this. Believers live expecting Christ. In Matthew 24, 42, watch, therefore, you know not what hour your Lord doth come. Matthew 25, 13, watch, therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour in which the Son of Man is coming. James 5, 9, do not grumble against one another, brother, unless you be condemned. Behold, the judge is standing at the door. Titus 2, 11 through 13, the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in the present age, looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. 2 Timothy 4, 8, Finally, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day. And not to me only, but also to all who have loved his appearing. It's not that we simply desire it. It's that we love it. You see, and what is happening to the church, and I see it today, is it's lukewarm. And when Jesus is speaking here to Sardis, he's saying, you have a reputation that you're alive, but you're dead. You, you, you look like a, a body in a casket, dressed up. Beautiful but no life in you, plenty of activity, plenty of good theology, but no practice. You really don't think I'm going to return, Jesus is saying. Jesus said that a faithful servant is prepared at all times, but an evil one is not. In Matthew 20, 24, verses 48 through 51, it says that the evil servant says, my master delays his coming. And he lives a cruel and sinful life because he doesn't believe that the master is really returning. He's delaying. He's not here. He hasn't, this doesn't provoke him. And he calls that servant the evil servant. And so when Jesus is speaking here to Sardis, the church is filled with professing Christians who don't believe that he's returning. And so he makes it very clear to them that they need to be watchful. He also says, strengthen the things that remain the things that are ready to die. In other words, here's your answer. Go back to your foundations. Fan into flame the dying embers of your spiritual life. This church is busy performing deeds 
but they're only going through the motions. It's a church that's not filled with the presence of the Spirit. There's no concern for the lost. It's been said a church is in spiritual danger when it is more concerned with appearance than reality, when it focuses on current problems more than changing people's hearts by the gospel. John MacArthur said, no matter what its attendance, no matter how impressive its buildings, no matter what its status is in the community, such a church, having denied the only source of spiritual life, is dead. And then he says in verse 3, Remember, remember therefore how you have received and heard. Hold fast, he says, and repent. Return to the truths of God's word. Hold fast in faith. Trust in them as you once professed to do. In 2 Timothy 1, 13 and 14, Paul said it like this. He said, hold fast the pattern of sound words which you have heard from me in faith and love which are in Christ Jesus. That good thing which was committed to you, keep by the Holy Spirit who dwells in us. And then he says to hold fast to his word. Return to the truth of God's word. Guard it. Take care of it. Cling to it in faith. You know, it's true. We can stand in line for movies and concerts, for sporting events and political speakers, but we need to value his word even more. In Job 23, 12, it says, I have not departed from the commandment of his lips. I've treasured the words of his mouth more than my necessary food. And then he says, repent. Confess and turn away from your sin. I'll restore you. I will. I can, I can drift from the Lord for a long time, but it only takes a decision of the heart and a moment to come back. So confess, turn away from your sin. I'll restore you. But if you, if you don't watch, well, I'll come to you as a thief. If you refuse to come back to me, there will be consequences. You have a name that you're alive, but in reality, you have no spirit in you. The result will be that you're not going to be ready when I come for the church. Again, in Matthew 24, 43 and 44, know this, that if the master of the house had known what hour the thief would come, he would have watched and not allowed his house to be broken into. Therefore, you also be ready for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. You know what? I believe it's very possible as a matter of fact, it, it, it's, it is possible and it is reality that there are many, many churches that are meeting on Sunday. And I fear for this one, to be honest with you, that has the right theology but doesn't really practice it. That, that does say, oh, yeah, Jesus is returning. But we don't live like we think he is. We are more committed sometimes, and I'm not saying this to condemn anyone. I'm simply saying what I get concerned with as a pastor, which is my responsibility, by the way, to do. But I get concerned that the fire can go out. This church has a long history. It's almost 40 years old. And I can tell you that as my mind travels back almost 40 years now, I can tell you how we began with a handful of people. I can tell you how there was so much enthusiasm and excitement, how that the church grew at such a rate. It, it, we had a couple thousand members within eight years, and then we had to rent bigger buildings. And we, when we had in this building here, guys, on Easter Sunday, we had four Easter services in this building here. We would have Easter services 25 years ago with 7,000 people. We would have 9,000 plus people show up on Easter. And what happened? What happened? Did my teaching get that bad? I think that. Did I become that boring? Or did something happen to the hearts of the people who once attended? What happened? Where's everybody at? Where'd they go? What happened? Where's the enthusiasm? Where's the desire? We need it back, guys. I don't want this church to be a church that Jesus says, you're filled with, with true orthodoxy, but dead people. We need to examine our hearts. 
Are we as enthusiastic as we used to be for the things of the Lord? Do we still share our faith with people? Do we still cry for the lost? Do we tell our friends? Are we more enthusiastic about the Dodgers? I hate them right now. I was not a happy camper last night. But are we more enthusiastic? Listen, I, I was there when Gibson hit that home run. I was in that World Series game in 1988. I was in the right field uh, um, stands just past first, uh, first base. And there was an Oakland, uh, Oakland fan right in front of me. And when he was yelling and, and all, and I was kind of saying things here and there, to bug him. And when Gibson hit that home run and we saw that ball fly past us and land in the stands, there was an eruption I had never heard in my life. The screaming and the cheering, it went on for 20 to 30 minutes and didn't stop. Then we went to the parking lot to leave because the people in the stands wouldn't leave. And they stayed there as we were able to drive out because they wouldn't leave. And I heard the cheering and the screaming and the enthusiasm. And, and, and I think that, that that's a thrilling moment in my life when it comes to sports. But those people were more fanatic than believers are for Jesus Christ. They were more enthusiastic for a home run than we are about going home to be with Jesus Christ. And I think we have to watch out because it's very easy. Now, if you're feeling upset right now, you're under conviction. Repent. You're under conviction. Don't get mad at me. Get mad at yourself. Get mad at what's going on in your own heart because you have replaced the devotion of Christ. You just don't know it with other things. And Jesus could be speaking to me. He could be speaking to us. And he could say, you have all the right look. When's the last time you came to a midweek Bible study? When's the last time you served? When's the last time you did anything for the Lord? You know, I notice people come and go, but a lot of times it's the ones who did nothing, who expected to be entertained every time they came. And when it stopped happening, well, I've heard that story, they go other places to hear other stories. But they don't put into practice the things they're being taught. And because they're not, they drift away. And sometimes they have a name that they're alive, but they're dead. There's no real life. And Jesus is speaking, and it's something to hear. He says in verse 4, he goes, You have a few names, even in Sardis, who have not defiled their garments, and they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. Believers will be clothed, he's saying, in robes of righteousness. In the description of the white robed multitudes in this passage, the picture is of righteousness of the saints, not the righteousness of God, because it demonstrates the faithful service of the followers of Jesus, which is openly manifested. And so he's saying in the midst of this lifeless church, there are a few who are walking with Jesus. And that, that often occurs amongst the, the dryness of the desert. Someone said there will always be flowers growing. In Hebrews chapter 6, verse 10, it says, God is not unjust to forget your work and labor of love, which you have shown toward his name, in that you have ministered to the saints and do minister. And so he's saying, I will bless you. Notice in verse 5, I will not blot him from the book of life. Now, those who overcome are recognized as God's own throughout eternity. He speaks of the book of life. Jesus makes a promise to never erase the name of a genuine believer. In Romans chapter 8, verses 38 and 39, Paul said, I am persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. You see, the book of life contains the names of those who have, been, who have entrusted themselves to Jesus Christ. In Revelation 20, verse 15, it says, If anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. In Revelation 21, 27, it says, Nothing impure will ever enter it. 
nor will anyone who does what is shameful or deceitful, but only those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. Now, this isn't a threat, by the way, that he's going to remove a name. It's a promise that he will not. Jesus is promising to never remove their name from the list of the saved. And notice how he says, I'll confess his name before my Father and before his angels. When we've been able to give open invitations, I will normally uh, read out of or mem through memorization, quote Matthew 10, 32 and 33, which says, Therefore, whoever confesses me before men, him I will also confess before my Father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, him I will also deny before my Father who is in heaven. And the Lord Jesus Christ is going to openly and unashamedly identify with you, even as you have openly and unashamedly identified with him. The Lord desires to do a work in his church. We know the right things, and we may even do the right things. But Jesus is saying, you, have a, a, you, have, you hold to what is true without the passion of faith. You hold to what is true, and you, you're, you're ready and willing to discuss those things, to teach those things. But you don't have the power of my Holy Spirit. You know, when I was a young man, a long time ago now, I was raised in a different nation than I see today, an entirely different nation, a nation that I don't wish we'd return to, by the way. I don't, I'm not spouting nostalgia and sentiment, sentimentalism. I'm not. It was just different. It was a time that was different. We didn't have, for example, sporting events on Sundays. When I grew up, there were no sporting events on Sundays. Because Sunday, as a nation, was a day of rest. That's the way it was. We didn't have profanity in our movies. We didn't have profanity in our music. I mean, in the 60s, when John Lennon went out and said, we're more popular than Jesus Christ, there were kids who were taking Beatle albums and burning them in bonfires saying, you can't say this about Jesus Christ. There was actually a sense in the society I grew up in that was different. I used to walk down the street to... The, the store, we had a little general store. Uh, we called it the liquor store, but it was just down the street. And my dad would give me a quarter, and it was only a, not even a quarter mile from where I lived. And I would walk there on Sunday mornings with a quarter, and that's how much you paid for the uh, Sunday edition of the newspaper. And you would lift up the top, uh, uh, actually the second one, you would lift it up, and you'd put your quarter there and drop the paper back down and then take a newspaper, and there was a pile of quarters there. People wouldn't go and steal the quarters. They actually had honesty. They would leave the quarter there. I mean, you couldn't even watch TV programs like uh, uh, I Love Lucy. I mean, we used to think it was interesting that uh, Lucy became pregnant, but she and Ricky didn't sleep in the same bed. It was different. They used to have laws against uh, what they called undesirables. This is history to some of you I'm speaking. You don't know this, but this is the world I grew up in. They had what they called undesirables. A very famous actress um, who was having uh, relationships and affair with uh, as a woman, uh, married man, she was having a relationship with him. She came to L.A. and was getting off the plane to come in, and she was turned around and sent back to her home country because she was called an undesirable alien. Now, doesn't that blow your mind? One of the, one of the uh, I think it was the, um, was it the manager of the Dodgers uh, was going through a divorce, and, and the Catholic League began to boycott Dodger games because this man was, was, had, was they considered an immoral man. And the Dodgers uh, actually released him for a while because they said that he was, his morals were actually affecting the morals of the youth of America. All of that's foreign to you, isn't it? That's not the world you are in anymore, is it? It's not. The church used to have an influence, but it doesn't anymore. Because what has happened in our day 
is we're like that and have been branded for many years just those weird, wild-eyed, stupid, ignorant, hillbilly intellectual. We're intellectual hillbillies. We don't have sophistication. We don't think. We don't understand what the real world is, right? And that's what has happened in my lifetime. You know, my mom, before she went home to the Lord, to be with the Lord, said, you know, David, I'm ready to go. I just don't like what I've seen this world has become. When we have the kinds of things going on that are regarded as being not only good, but normal. When we have Christians who are saying things about abortion is a woman's choice without regard to the death of a child in a womb, something has happened. And we may claim to believe in Jesus Christ, but we don't show it in the way we think or live. I think that Jesus could say the same thing to the church today. You have a name that you're alive, but you're dead because you don't care about the things that I do. And we have to wake up, guys. We have to wake up. So many Christians don't vote. Millions don't vote because they think it's worthless to do so. And we allow evil to continue to creep in because we don't raise a moral voice in opposition. And we're afraid to be unpopular in school and, and ridiculed on the job for believing the things that God said are true. So in our mind, we say, I believe. But in our lives, it's another story. And Jesus says, I'm looking at you. I'm closely scrutinizing you. You have a name that you're alive. But you're dead. You're not looking for me to return. You're not expecting that I will. I'm telling you, it's true. Am I lying to you? I'm not. I'm telling you the truth. I'm telling you that if, if I, in this church right now, I have people watching online, and I'm grateful that you are. But we have become comfortable in the conditions we're living in rather than saying, God, do something about it, and I'm going to be part of the solution. I'm going to serve the Lord no matter what, and I'm going to be there no matter what to know Jesus Christ. I want to know that the church has gotten sleepy. The church has gotten sleepy, and we've gotten used to certain things, and we've normalized that, which the Lord says isn't normal. So we need to be awake, guys. We really do. We need to wake up what the Lord is saying to the church today. And that's what Jesus said in verse 6, he who has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the church. You see, Sardis, this church, is receiving this letter in the 90s, like between 90 and 96 AD. And Sardis, the church, is mentioned in history as having a church until at least 180 AD. There was a, a bishop named Melito, and he served the church, and that church may have, have heeded Jesus and did so temporarily. But today, no church exists in Sardis. I've been to Sardis. I've been to the ruins. There's nothing there because Jesus removed the candlestick because the church didn't listen. The church didn't act out what Jesus said. They did for a while, apparently, 70 plus years, but it, it, it really didn't transform. And now there's no living presence of the church in Sardis. And Jesus made it very clear. You have a name that you're alive, but you're dead. So no, I'm not mad at you. I'm glad you're here with us this morning. It can appear when I speak the way I did that I've got some ax to grind, and, and I don't. I hope you know that. But I do have a concern. I do have a concern. I do. I want to see this church alive in Christ. I want to see us serving Jesus Christ. That's, that's my life. And, and, and I do. And I want all of us to love the Lord together. So no, it's not an angry old man up there frustrated because his feet hurt. Is that I love you guys. Do you believe that? I love you guys. I really do. And that's why I tell you the truth. That's why. It's not anger at all. It's just a concern that I have for us. May we be ready when Jesus comes, for he says, I'm even at the door. May we be busy until our king comes for us, 
so that we can hear his voice in our ear when he says, well done. Because that's the only thing that matters in the end. Well done. My good, my faithful servant. And I'm sorry to say that Sardis had the right theology, but no fire for Jesus. God help us to not only have the right theology, but the fire of the Spirit within us. Stop avoiding fellowship. Stop avoiding service. Stop avoiding Bible studies. Start coming back. We need you. We need to equip you, and we need to reach this, this nation for Jesus Christ. We need you. We need you. Please.